The third factor of the seven factors of awakening is energy. And in Pali, virya. Virya overlaps and intertwines with vayama. And vayama is what you find as the sixth factor of the path, right effort, samma vayama. Uh, so effort and energy are somewhat indistinguishable. Right effort calls for the rising of energy, and this is a very deliberate action. So sometimes it doesn't occur to people to create energy. They feel lethargic, they complain that they're tired, and uh, they just accept that that is the state of their mind, and they have to obey their present condition. The Buddha is not into that. He says, don't accede to these negative states of lethargy. Now stir up energy, create energy, and so that your energy is at the service of right effort. So it's not just energy in itself. Sometimes these factors are taught outside of the Eightfold Path, but they all belong within the Eightfold Path, and you really can't understand them unless you put them in the right context. If they're not in the context of the Eightfold Path, you can have all the energy you want. Lots of people have energy. Children jump around and exhaust their parents. Teenagers do the same thing. Uh, all kind, there are people who are excessively energetic, a little on the manic side. This is not laudable necessarily. That energy is unchanneled. And for kids, of course, the parents have to decide how to channel their energy. If you just let them run around, uh, create havoc, and it won't be of any use to anybody. So. This is what we actually learn in life, is how to channel energy. If energy is not directed skillfully, then a lot of chaos happens. And this is the same in the spiritual dimension. Energy is at the service of right effort, and we need to understand what right effort is. Right effort is to overcome and remove negative psychic problems. And those include anger, craving, desire, sloth, of course, uh, specifically sloth, but also agitation, which is energy taken to an unusable level. So you will see this in people. They, they have a bad night because they can't sleep. They're, they're worried and agitated. They have a bad day because they're worried and agitated. They're highly excitable, can't focus, can't concentrate, etc. That is an excess of energy and it produces agitation. I think that's a, a bit of a epidemic these days as well. Excess motion of the mind, so short attention span, what do they call ADHD, and there are all kinds of attempts to tranquilize the person because the energy is not at their service. And then of course there's the opposite. There are two epidemics going on. One is agitation, the lack of focus, and the opposite is depression and lack of energy. Of course, these are well understood in the time of the Buddha as primary human conditions. These are part of human nature, but they should not be considered just natural and they should not be actually accepted and tolerated. They need to be treated. In uh, modern times, we treat them with medications often. Of course, not always. Uh, there is therapy and so forth. But this is the essence of Buddhism and Dhamma, to treat these as unacceptable. They interfere with your well-being and happiness. So this uh, energy needs to be directed to right efforts, and right efforts mean you must overcome the five hindrances. And when you do, you will be accessing much more available energy. So a person who's burdened by these psychic irritants loses energy. There's a tremendous amount of human life energy 
devoted to the problems of existence, and the problems are usually false problems. So, in fact, many of your problems are not problems to be solved. They're primarily problems to be dissolved. So that I, I often have interviews with people, and we talk, they talk about their problems. So one of the ways to deal with problems is the first task is to see if serenity itself, not, not addressing the problem, not thinking about the problem, not coming up with solutions to the problem, but putting the problem aside and going to a serenity practice, such as the breath or loving kindness, pure serenity, no uh, attempt to work through or solve the issue whatsoever. And to do that until you actually can attain a state of serenity where you're not troubled by this the situation. And then to ask yourself whether the problem is real or not. And probably 95% of the situation is that it dissolves. You don't solve most of the problems of life, you dissolve them. And when you have serenity and clarity and it doesn't dissolve the problem, then you have the clarity to solve the problem. And that's the optimal state of mind. Let us say the opposite of this, that that kind of worry that you have at two o'clock in the morning where you cannot sleep, but your, your intelligence and your emotional balance is weak because you are in a state of sleep deprivation. A lot of worries and concerns that, that seem very real and problematic at two in the morning after you have had some sleep and you wake up and you are fully refreshed and lucid, they turn out to be not a problem at all. So notice this, the transition of the type of energies that you bring to your mind itself, your consciousness and your emotional structure itself. Many problems are not real. They are just the condition of a mind that is not in good shape, is not uh, well-structured. So this is uh, what is meant by right effort, is to address these wasted types of energies used for solving problems that don't need solving. A lot of worry about the future, for instance. The future is intrinsically unknowable, and yet one makes all kinds of dire predictions for one's future, imagines all kinds of things going wrong, and that would be a wrong kind of use of the mind instead of putting in causes for good results to arise and realizing that it's not about wishing, hoping, or fearing about the future, but actually putting in good causes, including acquiring knowledge and emotional skills now in the present, which will come to your aid in whatever situation you are in in the future. The other area which energy is directed to is the promotion of positive mental states. And these are such things as goodwill, sympathetic concern for others. By the way, when we talk about this usually as compassion, but I should just interject a little bit. I won't talk too much about compassion. That's a separate topic really altogether, but there's a great mistake made in the, in the culture in general, especially in the West, that compassion is a form of grief at the sorrow of others, the, the distress of others, or even for oneself. It's grieving and sorrowing in sympathy with others. And this is a, a fundamental waste of energy. It's the wrong kind of compassion. There's another kind of compassion which is informed by, by wisdom. And it is aware of others' suffering, but does not participate in the suffering because that would be a waste of your well-being and happiness. And now you will have increased the amount of distress in the world instead of reducing it. So the fact that others are suffering does not mean that you should also suffer and increase the amount of suffering. In fact, the opposite is true, that you should decrease it. So it's a form of loving kindness for those who are suffering. But the loving kindness is 
not a deficit on your emotional structure. It's a positive and, of course, is full of energy. Loving kindness, for instance, is a way of accessing energy. Loving kindness actually has enormous energy storage. It's, it's nuclear. It's nuclear. <laughs> so a mother who has loving kindness for her children is... Uh, continuous in her ability to produce energy in order to assist her children. And uh, anybody who has in a family who is concerned and caring about the other members of their family is tireless in their abilities. They, I see many admirable people. They, they work two jobs. They take their kids to the soccer practice when they're really tired. They skip things, etc. This energy, the source of their energy is actually loving kindness and concern with others. And as well, meditators uh, also have concern with themselves as well as their families and friends. And so they make the effort and energy to go off on retreats and to establish themselves in uh, meditation structures in their daily life. They need to continuously rouse energy because they care about themselves. So it's a concern for one's own well-being. And by the way, sometimes there's a strange belief, some sort of legacy belief that one shouldn't ignore one's own well-being and just care for everybody else. That, that is a, an imbalanced view of things. And those who do that and have that attitude will burn out. We see this in all kinds of areas of life where one becomes excessively socially concerned with the well-being of others and neglects one's own well-being and the sources of their own energies. This is self-defeating. Whether you like it or not, positive energy, and that's a nice phrase, positive energy, which the, such things as loving kindness have are positive energies, always take account of oneself as well as others. And this is the right use of energy, the right direction of energy. So you have to use these energies for wholesome purposes. So this is how right energy works. Energy occurs again in the, we talked a little bit about this in a previous talk. Energy is one of the five faculties. So we have this five faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And the two that tend to balance each other and are necessary balances are concentration and energy. And what is the center of the teeter-totter here that balances these two? Mindfulness. So, of course, we began with mindfulness. The first factor of the seven factors of enlightenment is mindfulness. And that mindfulness is continuing and pervading the second factor, which is Dhamma Vichaya, or investigation of the truth, the relevant truth, truths which involve the inquiry into the causes of suffering and their alleviation. And that mindfulness persists in the midst of energy and effort. So mindfulness actually pervades all of the other six factors of awakening. Right mindfulness is, is present in all wholesome mental states. This kind of information, that kind of specific talk is actually found in, uh, in Abhidhamma type of teachings, these very clinical analysis of uh, all of the factors that are going on in states of consciousness. But you can see that this is also present in the Eightfold Path. So without going into the scholastic side, the Abhidhamma side, the Abhidhamma means the higher Dhamma or teaching, I don't necessarily think it is the higher teachings. The basic discourses of the Buddha contain the highest of all of the teachings, and they're just in a more accessible language. But you notice that the Eightfold Path has this right mindfulness in it, and it has to be included in all of the other factors as well. You can't have right view without having mindfulness. You can't have right intention without having mindfulness. You can't have right speech without mindfulness. You can't have right action without mindfulness. You can't have right livelihood without mindfulness. You can't have right effort without mindfulness. You can't have right mindfulness without mindfulness. 
And you can't have right concentration without right mindfulness. So mindfulness continues on into right concentration. And of course, wisdom always has right mindfulness embedded in it. So these two things are all, they're functioning hand in hand, right effort, right mindfulness are functioning hand in hand. And they just assist whatever else is going on. We already spoke about Dhamma Vichaya or investigation of Dhamma. That's a very active element, use of the mind. It's inquiring, moving around, asking questions, examining, reflecting. And we will see that as we go along in the seven factors of awakening, that we shift gears into a different type of consciousness, a different type of mind state, which is equally valid and important. We're not excluding the active side of the mind, active contemplation, active meditation, but it also needs the support of a, a stilling type of meditation as well. I think in the West, the word meditation, we just borrowed this from the English language. And when you look it up in the dictionary, it doesn't seem to have any explanation that corresponds with what we would call samadhi or what the Buddhist type of deep meditation is. It's more or less thinking and contemplation, contemplative practices and so forth. They're always about thinking about things as well. They hardly, you can hardly find an English word which which represents the idea of stilling the mind and holding it in a state of deep stillness and the benefits of that. So when we're borrowing all these English words, sometimes they have a lot of baggage that comes with them. Each of these English words that we translate Pali words from have to be explained and, and worked on in order to get the right feel for the, the meaning of these things. So energy is required for the balancing of concentration. Concentration will come up, or what we call samadhi, will come up as the sixth factor of the seven factors of enlightenment. What the natural tendency of concentration is, is to, is to sink into stagnation or sloth. And when I teach uh, meditation retreats, 10-day meditation retreats, I often give advice. Uh, and this is contrary to a lot of ways that these retreats are done traditionally in the Asian structures sometimes. Retreats and Buddhism and the use of the mind have a cultural context and to import ideas that work perhaps in Asia in the 18th century or 19th century in a faith Buddhist culture, to drop it into the West in the 21st century in a completely non-Buddhist culture with minds that have been trained and work in different ways is quite often just inappropriate. So one of the things that you might have encountered if you went off to Burma to a retreat or Sri Lanka to a retreat would be that you show up for the retreat and right at the first thing is four o'clock in the morning, you're up and there's meditations all day, encouragements to, to stay focused on your objects and et cetera. So I teach these, uh, I use the seven factors of enlightenment in order, especially if I'm teaching a seven factor of enlightenment retreat. And that is that the energized side of the the menu, that is mindfulness, investigation of Dhamma, energy, and joy, are not in a random order. They are actually first, and then more serene types of meditation come second. The tranquility, deep jhana, attempts at jhana, and the equanimity that is characteristic of the deepest of the jhanas come afterwards. So I encourage people, and you might, if you're going to retreats, you might try this approach that the first at least three to four days of a 10-day retreat, that you're, you should not attempt to just instantly get into a deep state of single-pointed focus on the breath or something like this, that the tendency will be, for, for some, not for all, will be to fall asleep to nod off. And you'll see, this is in meditation retreats, you'll see all kinds of people show up nodding off. 
The reason why is that they're coming from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. They may be working the night shift for the last year, you know, a 12 hour nursing shift all night. And then you show up to a retreat and you're into the day thing. And everybody says, get up at four o'clock in the morning and function like all day long. It's uh, bright and cheerful and it's not going to happen. Everybody's coming from a different background. They might have traveled by air for 12 hours to get to the, the retreat center and so forth. So to, you can't treat everybody the same. You have to acknowledge the, the specific situation. This is the case that I want to emphasize. The Buddha himself said that this is an individual practice. There isn't one size fits all. There isn't a silver bullet meditation technique that works for everybody. And you will see the suttas are voluminous. There are many volumes, thousands of little talks that, uh, collected by the Buddha over the 45 years that he taught. It's a huge collection of teachings, and they're addressed to different individuals in different situations. And he talks to the same individual at different stages of their life and gives them different advice and uh, structures to work on. So this is the nature of this more flexible and uh, tailored kind of approach to things. It may be that a person is a little bit over-energized. Maybe they're very inspired. They go off to a meditation retreat and they're just, uh, can hardly stay on the ground. They're extremely energized and joyful. And then in that case, more serenity meditation might be appropriate but often in the first few days because the, you come into a, a low sensory environment, a monastery, quite often people just have been preparing for it and busily arranging for somebody to water the plants while they're gone, etc. So they, they show up and that when you deprive them of their normal stimulation and so forth, it, the mind often just shuts off, just drops, and you, you see people nodding, nodding off. So this is not all that beneficial. That means what is required is more energy. And energy can be developed and cultivated by walking meditation, going outside. So that's another structure you'll see in, in group meditation is that everybody shows up and sits quietly for an hour and then a bell rings and then you stand up or do some walking and then a bell rings and then you sit again, etc. So. This, uh, again, is, a, is a, an approach to humans as if one size fits all, as if everybody benefits from sitting at that time and everybody benefits by walking at that time. You can see why people do this. How else are you going to do it? It's really a model. It's modeled on, on a school system where students, is 30 people show up, you have to have them sit there, even though Johnny is nodding off on his desk and and Peter is staring out the window and so forth, and you force them into a kind of a, a situation because you just have to deal with 30 kids. Um, and if you are in a meditation retreat, there might be 25 or 50 adults. What are you going to do with them all? They can't just do anything. So you put them into a rigid form. So this is something I uh, myself have done early on in my attempts to teach people. But... Later on, I decided, no, this is, people need, some people need to be out walking while the other ones need to be sitting. And it's not the same for everybody. So if you can possibly arrange situations like this, it's more beneficial. The individuals have different needs. The individual's bodies have different needs at different times. Their minds have different needs at different times. And so I try to structure retreats so that we actually are addressing as the Buddha indicated, sometimes you need to stir up energy and create energy. And at other times you need to create serenity and calmness. And it's not the same for everybody. And it's not the same throughout the day for anybody either. So this is an attempt to address the individual as the Buddha endlessly indicated. So this, uh, you may consider this when you go, if you go to uh, group retreats and so forth, you must realize that part of the structure of retreats sometimes is simply for the convenience of the teacher and the situation. 
but that optimally it's much more individualized. This is what we can learn by inquiring deeply into these seven factors. You see that the more you examine them, the more, more information and skills you can derive from them. They have a very large capacity if you can connect them and put them within the context of the teachings of the Buddha. So I want to go on to the next factor, which is a beautiful factor. It's joy. This is important and many people will find it surprising that joy is an element of enlightenment. (laughs) Others will think that that's the only element of enlightenment. (laughs) People have all kinds of impressions of what enlightenment is and the enlightened mind is. So one of the ways to access this is to actually look at the seven factors of enlightenment. This is the Buddha is giving this particular teaching to show these are the kind of uh, contents, this is what an enlightened person does with their mind, how do they feel, what's their emotional condition. So the Buddha is giving a, a brief handful of teachings that tell you about this. So the emotional quality that an enlightened person feels in a substantial portion of their waking life is joy, the emotion of joy. And uh, it's a form of uh, lightness of being ease of being, and it's not unfamiliar to other humans, although there are are humans who perhaps have really not had much in the way of joy in their life. They may not even have a few minutes of joy. Others, they have moments, they have hours of joy perhaps even, but they perhaps could go days, weeks, months, or even years without really having the taste of joy or joyful experiences. So this is the nature of enlightenment. And enlightenment might be said, another way to speak about it is unburdening. Why does joy arise? Is the person trying to maintain joy all the time? Not necessarily, although it's entirely okay to try to raise joy deliberately, stir up energy and joy. Notice energy comes before the joy. The energy is arising because the mind is being used properly and not misdirected, not burdened. The energy rises when the, the psychic irritants, the, the problems, the unnecessary problems that one self-creates are abandoned. The mind becomes energized. The body, the heart, the, your body and mind become energized. And also what follows that is this experience of joy. And the joy is because you are not being harassed. (laughs) Most, why is it that um, people aren't experiencing joy all the time? Is it some genetic thing where you just are joyful or you're missing the gene or something like that? Or is it you're not enough vitamins or... People have all these theories. They, they try to exercise more. They, they're, they're looking for joy. They're looking for it in all kinds of practices. They're looking for it in, uh, in horoscopes and mystical ideas and all kinds of exercises and jumping jacks and all kinds of ways. But actually the, the problem is that the mind is being harassed by wrong training, wrong ideas. And you can't be joyful and you can't be energetic because you're burning a lot of energy just grinding the gears. So the five hindrances, anger, greed, sloth, agitation, and doubt, are you're displacing a huge amount of energy just grinding the gears in the wrong way. The mind is grinding. When you stop doing that, energy arises by itself because there's huge natural energy, but it's not being squandered anymore. So you feel energized and joy arises. And the joy is the natural state of the mind. So this is something the Buddha talks about. He says that the mind is luminous in nature. Now, when he says luminous, we, we, this reference to light is not necessarily literally light. It means that it's, it's joyful, clear, buoyant, those kind of things applied to the heart, really. 
the word that he uses, pabasara, there may be a side effect of, of sort of internal light. You notice that, of course, when people, the poetic descriptions of depression is that everything looks dark. You know, life, the prospects are looking dark, right? So that's the nature of depression. And then joy is that everything is looking light. The, everything is put in a new context. The birds are singing, the flowers are out, the sun is shining. These are all metaphors, aren't they, for an internal state. So how do you access that internal state? How do you get to that joy? By ceasing from self-harassment, and the five hindrances are self-harassment. So these are the enlightenment factors. This is what an enlightened person no longer does. The enlightened person, right at, at right effort, the sixth factor, has deliberately been informed that they can overcome these psychic irritants and hindrances. And it's within their own power and nobody else's. And don't look outside of you for it. Don't look to another person for it. But it's you that creates this and you that can stop doing negative things to yourself. And that you can start doing positive things with your mind. And so when you succeed at this, joy follows naturally. The energy and the effort has been put in, and one of the sign, one of the clearest signs is the emotional experience of joy. You are now using your mind in a skillful way. Now, this is like learning any other skill in life. Notice, uh, you know, as a child learns to walk, at first it's just a totally consuming effort to just stand, and then they fall over. They fall down again and again, and eventually they can manage to make a few steps, and it's quite an experience of joy, both for their parents and, and themselves. It's just a, it's like winning the Olympics, you know, the get three steps in a row without falling down, and everybody's just smiling and celebrating. Incredible sense of autonomy. You've learned something, and you continue to develop these skills. Notice that uh, various humans have varying degrees of skills with uh, moving their body around in space. Some of them remain um, a little on the clumsy side, unbalanced, never quite got the, the full skill of walking even. <laughs> and others continue to cultivate and develop it. So they spend a lot of time with sports and ballet and gymnastics and so forth, and it's astonishing what they can achieve. So this is what we're doing with the mind here. This is emotional ballet. This is the higher end of the spectrum. This is, this is the cultivation and training of the mind, not just with ideas, not learning just to read, write, and arithmetic, but these are emotional skills and ideas about how to face life. And if you do them well, the mind becomes buoyant, light, joyful. And so this is what the Buddha is trying to say, indicate with these factors of enlightenment. This is the nature of the mind. It is intrinsically joyful, but it is harassed. You must stop harassing it. And he advises you also to get away from people who harass you. <laughs> he says, what a blessing in life it is to leave behind those foolish people who oppress you, create negativity, are toxic. What a blessing. It was the first blessing in life. Get away from that. Get away from the external agencies that do this to you. And also stop doing it to yourself. Don't bring it along. And you will be blessed. And how do you know you're blessed? Because joy arises. Just to free yourself from an oppressive situation. You know, you've all, had, you've all had the unfortunate circumstances to be in the company of people who are really unpleasant to be with. Um, in, in jobs, and in relationships, and in family situations, in all kinds of situations, you find yourself being uh, oppressed and harassed, and it is truly something to be rejoiced in to remove yourself from that situation. All the more so that you do not do this to yourself, that you are not the fool keeping you harassed. 
uh, this often doesn't occur to people that they should give up associating with their own foolish nature that which harasses them. And if they do, the moment they do, and it usually it's often because they're persuaded by wise people that it's unnecessary, the types of things they're inflicting on themselves, the type of thoughts and process they're inflicting on themselves are unnecessary. And so they're, that's the joy and the beauty of right association. So a, a wise person encourages you not to do that to yourself. Some people are, are naturally developing in their wisdom and they understand, I should stop harassing myself like this. They don't actually need advice from another person. They thought, you know, I'm going to just give it a shot where I stop doing that. They may have been encouraged to have negative attitudes towards themselves. They're raised this way. This is the tone of their family or the tone of their whole society or something like this. And they say, enough of this. Is it possible to live some other way? And this is one who breaks free from these harassments and these oppressions. And so this is the rising of wisdom. And what is followed by that? Joy. Energy and joy. Yes. So these are, in brief, the third and fourth factors of the seven factors of enlightenment. And we will go on to our last three factors in our future talks.